Hello, everybody. I'm Zen, and I'm a software engineer. So today, I'm going to tell you about a bit about Mesos to IM. And I'm working for Shipset Media Group. A bit about myself. I'm a Java developer before, and like from last year, I'm just doing development in Go. So let's go. So a bit about the company. I'm working for Mercy Shipset Media Group. Maybe man, nobody here has listened about Shipset, but it has like another face. It's like uh, it has almost like uh, 32 products and it has presence in 22 countries. And I will tell about like marketplaces area that is more famous. For example, for the people in France, it will be famous as Le Bonquois. And the people in Austria, maybe it's like uh, Spok will have it. And people in Spain, it's Info Jobs, Photo Casa. So it's like it's all over the Europe. And uh, it's doing pretty well. But as a developer, I will say it's a pretty cool company to work for. So a bit about the, the team. Yeah, we are like six people in the team. And we are the CR team, the Common Runtime Environment team. And uh, we are all based in Barcelona. And we have, I have got two guys there. They have decided not to pass my slides today here. I don't know. I'm doing something wrong for sure. But yeah, and later we have a contributor for Mrs. Triam. He's Vicen. He's a guy from Valencia. Apart from development, he knows how to do a nice paella. So you can discuss about development, but about paella, he's always right. So you're going to lose the conversation. So let's go. So as a team, we are like not so much common runtime environment. We have actually three clusters about of Mesos, Hadoop, and Kubernetes. So I would say that we are common to say that we just want to maintain like all the company have only one Mesos cluster, one Hadoop cluster, and one Kubernetes cluster. And about the and we are just onboarding teams. So like not all. If somebody from Shipster would say, I don't know where is this, so maybe it's still not onboarded to our team. And we have a long way run for the Mesos, but for Kubernetes, we're still pretty starting. So as for the workload, I would say that we have like, this is about the daily workload. So it's like uh, 6,000 jobs run in Mesos, more than 15,000 jobs in Hadoop. And on daily basis, we have averaged like 2,000 pods running in Kubernetes. But for sure, these numbers don't say anything, so I will just put this. But I'm going to focus on the Mesos part today. So for uh, the message part is like uh, we have almost like uh, 8 GB per task. Like uh, one task can take about like 50 minutes, more than 50 minutes. And on average, it's using like 1.4 of CPU. So it says a bit more about the cluster and not just like empty tasks running 6,000. So as a team, like I would just like to say that as a team, we have achieved the auto scaling thing. That's pretty cool. But uh, let's talk about the. Like we, our Mesos cluster is continuously going scaling up and down. So, and we just keep it tight to our usage. But the cool thing is, like, we have like zero fail task, like when are scaling down. So basically, why, why, how we have done that is basically we have implemented the maintenance primitives in the all Mesos frameworks that we were using. So actually, yeah, we are the creepy guys that are going on the GitHub and asking the frameworks, hey, can you develop this? And as far we have uh, done it ourselves for Marathon. For Kronos, the protocol is open, but we are already using it in the production. And for Arithmetic. Like for the guys who don't know Arithmetic, it's a pretty small framework done in Go. And it's really good for run one's task. And it's working quite well for us. So yeah, uh, let's go. And if somebody is like more interested in like how this is going, like I'm just talking so fast about the other scaling and zero fill tasks. So if you guys are interested, you can check out this project that we have done in our team. It's called Death Node, and it helps a bit more putting the nodes in maintenance, and then takes care of killing them and going down. So for Mesos to IM, let's go for Mesos to IM. From to talk about it, I'm going to skip the Mesos part because I'm going to presume everybody here knows what is Mesos. But if somebody is going to ask me, like, still don't know what is a Mesos, I would say that it's like an open source cluster management manager that handles workloads pretty well in a distributed environment. 
and most important through dynamic resource sharing and isolation. So yeah, let's go to the EM. EM is actually the Amazon service. Before I was hearing in the other presentation, like 78% of Mesos cluster are in, are in Amazon. So I think pretty much everybody should know about that. But before doing that presentation, I already prepared about talk about EM. So explain about a bit about what is the what it stand for. So for example, EM stand for identity and access management. So for me, it's just take care of who and how, like who can do what and how they can take care of that. And it's basically the authentication and authorization part for Amazon. But the but the most important part is like uh, it's quite extended its usage. So it can you can define EM roles based on action. Like I can do on what kind of I can do a get, put, or delete that kind of actions. But moreover, you can define it on the resource level, like on S3 data or your Redshift. But okay, Redshift is more like a service-based role. But and then you can tag your roles based on the roles. And what is most important for this presentation are the temporary security credentials. So it's these are like short-term credentials that the EM provides you, and you don't have to like kind of distribute your credentials, save it in a security wall because uh, they are just temporary for the current use or for the request you have made. So I will give a little talk like about how it works, but uh, in the case if somebody knows, no, let's imagine we have a, like a bucket in S3 where we save photos, super secret photos, and we don't want everybody or every user to get access to them. And uh, we just define our service that has to access these pictures. And we define a role, EM role, that is allowed to have access to create, delete, or whatever to these pictures. And then later, for sure, you we can assume this role through a, your local machine or through your credential, but we don't, we don't even want that. We want only one of our production server can access to these pictures. So we define a, like a instance profile, and we allow that our role that can access to the pictures can be assumed by this instance profile. So what it makes in the end? It makes like uh, everybody that is on that EC2 instance can assume the role of the pictures and actually can access data. But anybody that is outside that is instance cannot do that. And this is done by uh, the feature of assuming role. And where they will have like in Amazon have like a STS API. STS stands for Security Token Service. So it's kind of pretty cool feature, and for sure we are using it. So our use case. So we have like a Mesos cluster, and we have our frameworks that are running. We have Marathon, Spark. I'm not going to talk about like there are a lot of applications like Luigi and Airflow also. But uh, then later we have a strong API that is like our taking care of our security. Okay, so nobody can actually create a job there. We have kind of like cluster admins that take care of creating a job. So these jobs are hardly associated with roles. So if I create a job like to access my pictures. Somebody will give me access and make sure that I only have access to this picture and I don't take any other role. And then this, the problem is that here we have a cluster that can access a lot of data. Like before they were saying the data is oil, so we have like more than one petabyte of oil. And user can access this and do their jobs there. But then later we had this use case came like a couple of data engineers came to us and they were doing their jobs on Jupyter notebooks. Jupyter notebook is like a scratch book if no, somebody does know. And you can do your stuff on it and like launch Spark jobs. You can do your stuff in Python. You can load there the, the condas that you want. You can even, I like for example, I'm doing this stuff on Jupyter in Scala. And then I can pass the data sets to the, in the end, the amazing part is all in the browser. So it's like a notebook, kind of, and you can later share it. So the data engineers came to us, and they were like, they want to set up a, like a Jupyter in our Mesos. And actually, in this year, in the Mesos Con Asia, 
they explain about how to set up a um, Jupyter Hub in Mesos. It's nice talk. I would recommend that. So what we did is like the idea was to we modified a bit the Jupyter Marathon spawner. It's on GitHub and to adopt it to our authentication. So in the company we have like a a portal kind of and anybody can access developers and user can access to this portal and once you have access to this portal we make sure that or the identity team make sure that you are authenticated and you they give you a token and everything like that of the auth so we have to modify a bit the jupyter hub and we did also like a small it was a like a small reverse proxy in go to also take care of the the setup part of uh, to because the Jupyter have a, like a kind of admin console and you can access to it. So we wanted to modify a bit, so we just did bit a bit of gateway there. So in the end, like uh, the our happy data scientists wanted to come and uh, deploy and ask to Jupyter Hub, and it's like a dashboard, pretty cool, and ask them, hey, we want to deploy our notebook. It's like kind of we call it workspace. So they come to their Jupyter Hub and they share Jupyter Hub and they ask, hey, we want to deploy. And then everybody gets their notebook. And it's all from this, this is like a isolated, but everything is later deployed in the same cluster I was talking with. Then from once they have deployed their notebook, they can launch their stuff to the Spark. They can even, if they want, they can deploy to Kronos. They, they can access to a lot of oil. And uh, this is pretty amazing, but the thing is like here, we have got a situation like, we have a Mesos, the role we are were using that we have a strong API that was taking care of that part, nobody was able to assume another role, and because it was uh, pretty much impossible as it was defined on the job creation part. And the job creation part was done by people, by the, the cluster admins, so, but here we had like uh, like a one notebook could assume the role one and it was assigned to the resources that were part of the role one only. And the other notebook, the other user have access, like I will just say like, for example, a team should not access the other team's data that were in there and only access to data that the role were assigned to. But the problem with here, we had that anybody could access like role. Once inside the notebook, you can actually start a terminal assume another role and uh, just see all the data that you should not see. So the isolation is like pretty much gone in this case. So we could not do that. It was like the, the yeah, that I was explaining because the users could access to other people's resources and this was a pretty much serious case for us. We could not able to do like uh, deploy the Jupyter Hub in our cluster because this would open our our cluster. The problem, <coughs> yeah, the problem was for sure the uh, privileged instance profile because anything that is running on our message cluster, if we have the same instance profile, they can, they just need to go to the Amazon console or any other way, take out the EM profile the other team has, other users have, and they can just assume it and it's like just pretty simple. And that was a no-go for us at least. So yeah, <coughs> sorry. So yeah, we have, sorry, we have talked about the cluster. So one part we have the cluster already decided, but the other part was like what we are using to assume the roles. So what we are using the assume the roles and everything is like the EAM. And so let's take deep how it actually works. So, like EC2, uh, the credentials, like how the EM role is getting for the temporary credential we're talking, that just goes through these two options. Like years ago, it was just only one option, the second option, but now they have also introduced the first option also. So, like one option is like you have the instance metadata, you just query on it, and you will get your credential for the roles you want, and you don't have to worry about it. But another option has been added like that's another endpoint the HCS the security token that if you you can just query on this endpoint and you will get your credentials 
and it's now the actually the default way to get the credential on the all the SDKs after the version like 1.110 it's like the default option but yeah for sure there's a small letters maybe you cannot read it I will read for you this is that there's a like a um, environment vi variable that is AWS container credential relative URI so if this environment is not set in your container or wherever you're running it always go to the option two that is the old option so if you want to force it you have to set it but uh, this is how actually the EM role for ECS tasks are working so ECS task is like the agent just put that uh, environment variable and it populates it with the, the that the credential provider version and with the task UID so in the end it's up, end up doing like uh, that makes sense like uh, the IP address like one the 172 to and then credential provider and it's also passing task UID that's pretty much cool because you can assign roles on task level and you can take care of the one task cannot see the roles of another task and you cannot get credentials so we also want that because but we were pretty far to migrate to the ECS task so we wanted to do it in our cluster so we the here's we started with the message to IM so in the end like for a task or anything that's inside the cluster it's pretty much transparent because you do the you, you do the call and in the end what you get is like the standard credentials these are temporary credentials but you can get your exercise exploration role secret and so this was a pretty nice way to go so here we decided to make a bit like a combination of the mesos and em so let's do so what is mesos to im it's actually just a diamond because the we the it's open source we did it open source so we can other people may also use it and it runs inside the mesos agents and in short words it just give us back control of the im policies on task level so the last query that i showed up what I was doing, so I want to take control of this, and we want to make sure that no task can see the other task roles. So in the this zero code of the message time would resume to this, like we manage IP tables, and then we retrieve a task ID. I'm saying task ID here because uh, it's custom, so it can be like app ID or whatever you design or which level you design, define and then fetch credential for the task and it returns to the to the container and to the manage ip tables if you watch the code it's just basically two routes like pre-routing and then forward that's it but i will better explain it with diagrams because it we can understand it better so for example i have now a mesos agents on a slave there's almost no i am privileges like it's naked it can just barely do it can have access to any data, it can have access to any service. And then later we have um, our task running on top of it with message to IM agent. So when we do like a, like when a task wants to get retrieve the credentials out of the, uh, to the uh, that URL that I was saying before, it just forward it to the message to IM, okay? And then message to IM go back to the container and it fetch the, environment variable that can be that is a custom let's say container id here and it gets the container id and then this is the important part that we have another host that has a, insta a privileged instant profile so that has more privileges than the agent mesos agent and for this we have also open source naive api because this we don't want to put our we want to dis we don't want to want to make an opinion because depending on company and it's different kind of stuff so we have put a like a nav api where you can define by your simple file which task which id correspond to which role but here the important thing is like we have given the roles the uh, we have allowed our roles that are being going to be used in the cluster that they can be assumed by this privileges instance profile so it goes to the it when we have the container ID, task ID, or app ID, we go to the credential host and we retrieve the credentials. So actually, it uh, assume role, 
in the assume role is the actually the temporary credentials operation. So an assume role, it runs the credentials to the message to IAM, and message to IAM returns it back to the task ID. So the, for the task, it, it never knew what was happening. Yeah, sorry. So it never knew what was happening. It had the credentials, and uh, it was pretty much transparent to the task. So I will, yeah, I have prepared a demo here, if I can show you. For sure a video, because I don't want to risk it. So here, uh, I'm going to run a simple container that has nothing special. It's like just it has like Amazon client. It's the Mesosphere Docker, and I, uh, the important thing is like uh, I would like to say that I'm putting the container ID, some random UID, and then the I have also set up the Amazon credential relative URI because without it, it would go to the normal endpoint and as it is a naked instant profile of the machine it won't see anything so when i started and in this docker they have already installed the amazon so it's pretty awesome i just get access to a bucket but i don't get any because the the amazon is saying me that this is not a cs task you cannot retrieve any it cannot find any task uid and nothing like that so i go and uh, just start the message to i am here and this is my the smoke that's also open source but here is the naive version because and i start it also so when i come back to my the, the docker that is running inside the message It just now I can access to the data. So like now I will explain what happened here and like now I can access to my super secret stuff and stuff like that. So like what has happened here is like, um, if you see in the, the screen, there is a container ID. So why I'm putting this container ID? Like why it's not app ID or task ID? It's because I've started the message to IAM with a prefix that is like container ID. So if you change the prefix, you can use it app ID, task ID, whatever. And it goes and will drive from the the Docker the same. And also, I put a pretty random UID, but it was not ran that random because uh, the, then we have the credential host, and we can see it from, for example, here. Yeah, what was I started with the roles? So what was in the roles? It was just a UID, and it has the role that it was supposed to assume. So like on one side, I have my API credential API that is taking care of which UID is like going to sign to which role. In our case, uh, I want to be sincere, we are not using this API, we are using like some random generator and it's, we are saving it in the, as for now in Dynamo and we are planning to move to the strong box. So that's it. So now I have started the message to IAM with the verbose thing and it will show like everything like it's in the host mode for example the API, the IP address, and also the container ID that it's used to retrieve from the container. And actually, it's not necessary the host mode because later I will do it with the bridge mode, but and <coughs> it was just to show. So later, like, if we go through the video. Yeah, because when I was doing the demo, I just started in the host mode, but we can remove it, the host mode, and we can just, by default, it's starting in the bridge mode. So we can just, for example, here, just try to get the the bucket that I only have privileges for that bucket. And if we see on the message to IAM logs, it will be, yeah, it's in bridge mode, and it's the same container ID, and that's it. So yeah, I think that's okay. So these are the the uh, repos where you can contribute. We welcome contribution because there are a lot of to go. Because we are lacking totally support for virtual network like Calico. We can w still have work to do. And uh, moreover, right now, the container ID, task ID, API, whatever we define, it's quite visible inside the Docker. 
So we are just working on to use secrets like uh, today what they were telling about how to use secrets in Mesos in a, to find a way to hide this. And this is, that's it. So if you guys have any questions, I would be happy to answer. Yep. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering if you could um, explain a bit more about how you maintain this map between, like in the example, it was a container ID okay, yeah. and, and the credentials, because yeah. um, obviously that seems like key to how this is secure. OK, yeah. OK, I will, in this case, we did it for JupyterHub, so I will just pass it really fast that part because I was pretty sure nobody is interested in how like internal working. So we have, I told that we have a, like a portal where we have identity team that makes sure that give credentials that have nothing to do with the Amazon credentials for sure to for every user. So in that part we have a, like a, we inject the user names, okay? So like every user have with their email injected in the spawner of the marathon of the Jupyter Hub. While we get the user, we go a, like authenticated API, and that's like pretty like uh, as for now we generate on it on fly, and we associate the user. We know that this user has to be mapped with this other role, so we create an entry in the our credential store that is like on that's open, but for sure then later we create a random UID and pass it to the to the when we are starting the task and it's it deleted when the task is finished or after some time if the task is running long yeah um thanks okay any other questions no okay thank you okay thank you